So the model that we have chosen for today is uh, by Brian Goodwin, and he introduced that and extensively discussed it in a book, in an interesting book, 1963, called The Temporal Organization in Cells. And the subtitle is, if I just look it up, a dynamic theory of cellular control processes. So where he uses what now is called a systems approach or an integrative approach to understanding non-trivial uh, controlled properties of biological function. And he did that using differential equations mostly. Uh, if you are interested, this book is as a PDF. You can download it from the internet. And for the purpose of today's session, I have simplified this model to the, what is perhaps the smallest version where this feedback can be implemented or is the most simple way of trying to understand what this feedback does. And at the top of this current slide, you can see it exemplified. So we have a process that is basically a linear chain of reactions where X1 is uh, one of the molecular reactants that is being synthesized and it also is being decomposed leading to uh, reactant X2. So we have a network with two nodes, if you like. And if it was just a linear chain, there's not very many important things that can happen. Things become more interesting when feedback control is introduced and uh, Goodwin suggested to look specifically at negative feedback. So negative feedback here is uh, with this round arrow and the red negative sign here means that the reactant X2 has a negative impact on the synthesis of X1. So we're going to take a, a deeper look at this. And we have this model written down in three different ways, just below the scheme. First of all, the mathematical model equations, as you would see them in a, in a typical uh, form for the differential equation with the differential operator on the left side and the functions on the right side. And uh, there's nothing to be afraid of. You can see three of the four terms are actually linear and just x1 or x2. And only the fourth term, the one that starts with a divided by, is the nonlinear feedback term that we're going to look at in more detail. So this is the kind of thing that exemplifies um, a very typical feature of signaling cascades and also uh, metabolic pathways or anabolic pathways like tryptophan synthesis, where the final products and amino acid then negatively feeds back on the beginning of the chain when it is available in abundance. So I think that's the major idea. And we take the model in the form that is highlighted here in yellow and want to study it in the three ways that I mentioned before. So I close down our, this, uh, this slide, hand over to Rob for bringing up MATLAB. And we're going to start by looking at this function that represents the feedback. I think we can take the webcam off now. We don't need that any longer. And we're sharing the screen now, so our screen is now projected. You can see our MATLAB window open and clean. And we have prepared a template which just has the Goodwin model in a form that you should recognize from the previous slide. So let's take a look at this model as it's now on the screen first. OK, so uh, this is the Goodwin model that we uh, just saw. Um, highlighted here. We've also been given some parameters uh, to investigate the system under. Um, should we first look at the uh, feedback function? Just the right. Part if of you this. can just highlight it, right? There's this one function that looks rather complicated, and let me just read it out for you. So that's meant to be a. A constant parameter divided by the sum of two terms. The first term is another constant parameter, Km, I think might be something like Michael's Menten constant. Mm. 
and added to it is ki times x2 to the power of n. So what does that mean? That means the rate equation for the first reactant has a supply that depends on the amount of the second reactant, x2, which we are uh, getting from the second rate equation uh, below this one. So that means if the amount of x2 is equal to zero, there will be no impact at all. And another way of getting this result is if ki, if this control parameter is equal to zero equally, that would play no role. So that's our case when we have no feedback control. Okay. So we're interested in how this um, function changes as the value of x2 changes. Right. right, so in a sense, we're now asking what does this function look like mathematically? What properties does it have? Where does it start? Where does it end? Does it have maxima, minima, inflection points, or the like? And we're not doing it in very much detail, but we want to use fplot to graphically display what this function looked like. So let's just call this the feedback uh, function. So again, it's given by this form. Uh, we want to create an anonymous function um, uh, that, refer that represents uh, this uh, mathematical uh, function. Uh, let's call that, um, say, feedback inhib inhibition, INH for short. Um, anonymous functions start with an at sign with the uh, variables inside. In this case, we want to use everything that is in here as a variable, just to start with. But actually, I'm going to change x2 just to x for the moment. I hope you can see that if we give x, that's the same as giving x2 in a minute. Well, actually, this is now in a form that um, I can understand. So we can just copy and paste that through. So a divided by km plus ki times by x to the n. Now we need to add in the parameters 2 to our uh, anonymous function doesn't matter which order as long as we're consistent. I'm going to go for x, a, km, ki, n. And then the function is defined oop, as a divided by km plus ki times x to the n. Okay, but that's great. But we know that um, fplot requires functions that only have uh, one uh, variable. So let's create some shorthand uh, functions called feedback inhibition 1. It's again going to be an anonymous function, but only with one input value. We're going to call our previous feedback inhibition function. We're going to leave x unknown, but now we're going to give it parameters. And should we start by giving the parameters that we were given up here? So a is 1, km is 0.1, next ki is 0.1, and n, which is 1. I think also we'd like to see what happens uh, when n equals 2. So I'm just going to copy and paste that line. Um, call it something new, feedback in addition 2, and set n to 2. Right. What would that mean? That would mean that the x is now squared, so that we have an impact that is parabolic rather than linear in x, meaning, uh, of course, always the, the parabolic means if the exponent is larger than 1, that for very small values, the effect will be even smaller due to the yeah. quadratic term. But if it's larger than 1, uh, then the impact will be heavier than the linear function. So there will be a more pronounced effect. OK. So that's our prediction. Should we see if it works? So uh, let's plot. And we need to hold on as we're going to plot both in the same graph. We can use fplot with fb inhibition 1. Give it some boundaries, 0 to 1, say. And the same again. Copy, paste, for p back in position 2. Of course, we need to give it a different color. Otherwise, we won't be able to tell them apart. We should be able to tell them apart. And we might just, just by, by looking at it, can we make any prediction from scratch without seeing the function? OK, so we're just looking at the feedback function now. So we're looking at this function as a uh, in no, we're looking at the output as a function of x, so right? So we want to have x on the horizontal scale, yeah, and we want to see the 
whole function then plot it on the vertical scale. So what what if x is zero? So x we is have zero. That before. We have there's no regulatory molecule present, and we just have a over km, which is one divided by 0 0.1 to so ten. That would be ten, ten right? Ten is zero. So if if that second term there with the x to the power of something is zero, then we have a divided by a km, which is equal to ten. So that's actually a good prediction because we know the starting value should be somewhere around ten. Yep. And what, what if x is infinitely large? So let's assume it's just beyond any control. What would be mathematically the result? Well, we'll get something divided by infinity, so that's going to be zero. So it's going to decay to zero. A divided by a very large number will be very small. So the larger it is, the smaller it will get. So we expect that for infinity, it should approach zero. Yeah. So that's already something useful. So we have some idea where the boundaries of this output will be. OK, so we see what happens when we run this. OK. The line's coming up small, so I will just make those larger so you can see. Maybe the font on the axis too. Yeah, make the font large. Okay, so I hope you can see that now. Number 10 pops up. So we do start at 10 uh, both, when, when x equals 0. Both graphs start at 10, and both graphs end at 5. Five. So why is it not zero? Well, because we've only got we've only gone to one. Not we've to only infinity. gone to one. We've not gone to infinity. We might check later if it really goes to infinity. Interestingly, they meet at one. Yes. Right. So there seems to be something happening at one, and we might look at a range that is a bit larger than one to see how that continues. So I think I suspect I know what's going on. Can you do it up to two? Okay. Yes, that's nice because we can see that 2 is actually the value where one curve overtakes the other, or they swap positions. So now we have to know which is which, Rob. Can you tell us? OK, well, I'm going to just close this and run this again because it's come up as the wrong colors. OK. Excuse me, I'm just going to make these uh, lines bigger again. OK, so, well, cheating and looking back at our script, I know that the n equals 2 is the red line. So we start off actually quite quite a lot slower. The inhibition is quite a lot less when n equals 2. But once it gets past a certain level, it gets bigger. Uh -huh. So that's the effect of the parabola telling us that for small concentration, the impact of this feedback is actually weaker or weak compared to the linear case. But for large concentration, the quadratic or this, this power term is makes the inhibition work stronger and more powerful. And then we can see that actually, if we go beyond one, this keeps decreasing, and we can uh, safely predict that this will go to zero for large concentrations. So that's an important feature. Also, uh, to remember that this is something that is potentially useful if uh, looking at drug targets. If a drug is supposed to block a certain pathway or signaling cascade, then it would have the impact of an inhibitor. Yeah. And this is a way of studying the impact of inhibition. So because we remember that what we have on the vertical scale is a rate. Yes. It's the rate with which this process happens. And the rate, if it decreases, is slower, means less of a flux through this one enzyme that sits on that node of our network. Okay. Right? So we have understood one term in our model.